Hello and a warm welcome to all of you to our third lecture today given by Christoph Wieschert on the topic of the human factor in education. Unfortunately, Joost is prevented from attending today, but we are happy that Martin is taking over today's introduction and moderation. And as always, you will receive your certificate of attendance at the end of the talk. And um, since the last lecture, we are also creating a shared contact list. So if you would like to be part of this list, just drop me your email into the chat and then I will add you to the list and you can edit it with further details afterwards. And yeah, with these words, I would like to hand over to you, Martin. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. And um, welcome to everybody from me all over the world, I can see. And um, I'd just like to pick up on a couple of things that we've um, we've heard in the first two talks uh, before I I introduced hand over Christoph. I don't need to introduce him, but I'd like to say a word or two about him. If I look back on Kenya's talk, which I watched in I watched the video of, um, I was impressed by her considering the situation that she was describing, the difficulties that she faced as a person of color within the Waldorf movement within anthroposophy, I was really moved by her faith and belief in anthroposophy. She really kind of said, anthroposophy actually has answers or has a, is a pathway which can help us to overcome the challenges and problems that we're facing. And that sort of that sort of stuck with me, this um, very frank and honest uh, commitment that she brought to expression. You could well imagine that somebody in her situation might ask questions about many aspects. Well, I'm sure she does, but it hasn't in any sense kind of undermined her basic belief that the ideas within anthroposophy um, offer us a way through this and a way forward. And just to pick up on a couple of things that Jost said last week, um, in a way he expressed a faith, he expressed a faith in what that which makes us universal, in other words, our individuality. He emphasized and described and characterized in several ways what it means to be an individual. And there were two things that he said that that resonated with me um, in looking back or recalling um, his talk last week, which was very full. And if anybody here who hasn't seen it should certainly take the opportunity to have a look at the at the video recording of it. It was you really need to sort of stop, make some notes and move on. There was a lot of content in it that I think was very important. But um, he talked about the need or, or rather individuality expresses itself again in the beliefs that we have. And what he meant was not beliefs that we have inherited because we are part of a particular community or a tradition, but beliefs that we have come to through insight, that we have worked through something and have arrived at a sense of it is evidential to us, it manifests, I can recognize it. And that requires our individuality to do so. And it's actually what constructs and builds our individuality around us in how we relate to other people. So this arriving at a conviction, arriving at a set of beliefs was the one thing. And the other thing that he um, emphasized was the <clears throat> how important it is that we don't just adopt traditions and practices because they seem to work or because we want to belong to a particular setting, that we actually think these things through ourselves, that we arrive at explanations, that we try out with people, that we share with other people, that we explain or we are in a position to explain explicitly why do we do what we do in world of education. And that leads me on to um, 
to Christoph's contribution because <clears throat> I've known Christoph for many years, had the privilege of working with him in various working groups. And in a way, Christoph has represented for me both the best of tradition as somebody who is a serious anthroposophist who knows his Steiner backwards and forwards, inside and out, who has continue to study the works and to relate them to his experiences um, over many, many years, and has helped us to um, often um, identify things. I remember uh, reading um, a paper that he published on the so-called uh, threefold division of the main lesson, the rhythmical part and the working part and the story part of the main lesson and how he kind of broke this down deconstructed it in order to build up a new uh way of looking at what are the factors which which influence us when we are planning our lessons when we are planning a main lesson and so christopher somehow always for me represented both if you like um a beacon raying out lived anthroposophy you could say he is a great traditionalist in that sense but not in any negative sense but in the positive sense that he lives it represents it and continuously questions it and continues to explore areas of world of education that other people have not looked into things that we often take for granted he has revealed them unpacked them and shared his thoughts so it gives me great pleasure <coughs> to hand over to him this evening and we will no doubt have some time afterwards for questions and comments. So Christoph, over to you. Thank you so much Martin. It was very nice what you said. I feel um, with your words I feel a little bit at home. Thank you. Uh, this evening I would like to share with you indeed ideas about the human factor in education. <clears throat> As we all know, education depends if, on the fact if there is in front of class a person who, who can do it, who can make it or not. But it is not so easy to grasp this human factor. So I will uh, start with a quote, with a kind of a motto by this uh, famous German philosopher, sorry that this is a German philosopher, but he is fantastic, no phallus. And Laura, please uh, give our first uh, quote here, no phallus. Completely being oneself is an art. Vollständig ich sein ist eine Kunst. You can and you are what you are able to be. Man kann und man ist, was man will. We are more or less an I as we want to be. Man ist mehr oder weniger ein Ich, je nachdem man will. So here in this quote, um, thank you, Laura. Here in this quote, you see the, that Novalis made this relation between the, the human identity and uh, how that identity expresses itself. And according to Novalis, the most direct expression of our identity is what we call our will, what we do, our actions. And... Um, that is uh, there, and that is also this human factor. And uh, we will go through a, a whole, uh, we will follow now a certain path. And in the end, we will come back on this motto, <clears throat> on this quote by Novalis, and look if it has enriched us a little bit. Before we enter this question of the human factor in education, I will try, it's a try, I will try to describe the education process independent, independent from a cultural background. 
I, I remember that long, long ago, Martin and I were in a, in, a, in a working group where we tried to find out what is indeed universal in education, independent from countries, uh, independent from cultures, beliefs, or whatever. Now, I, I, I try that now. It's a try. I, I say this, on all places on earth where children are born and where they are raised, they have a, 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 they have a need, a longing for love and care. Love and care for children little children, newborn children, kindergarten children, preschool children, school children. Love and care is, I think, it's a, a universal value. We can find that in all places. Then children all over the world, is my guess, they need place for movement and play. Uh, you know, even in the United Nations conventions about the child, the right to play is written down. Children have the right to play. That means they have the right for movement, to move. And the next thing is that children need room and space and especially need time that for imagination and imitation. Yeah, imitation. I make a remark now in brackets. You know, as far as I know, but I guess Martin knows that better, as far as I know, the concept of imitation in the way Steiner spoke about that is not generally understood in the in the scientific world of uh, education. A, a couple of days ago, I saw an impressive movie. I know there is a, a lot of around it, but that movie has the name El Sistema. And that is about this music teaching this music development in Venezuela started by this famous conductor Dudamel, who brought thousands and thousands of children out of poor areas, areas into music schools and learned them to play an instrument. And they were all coming together and played in, in orchestras in different levels El Sistema, I can highly recommend a look at it. It is impressive. But what was most impressive, the little ones, the little ones, so four, five, six, seven year old children, they got instruments from cupboard, violins, cellos, flute, trumpets from cupboard. And they were sitting together as an orchestra and they had to play on these paper instruments that made no noise, but they had to sing. And then they moved around and they did as if they are, that were real instruments. It is so moving to see that. And the, these little ones enjoyed that so much when they walked in with their double bass from cupboard. It's fantastic. There you see, they, they developed the imitation. And then at the same time, these little ones see the older ones in real orchestras. So there is a kind of understanding growing probably that this imagination and imitation is a very important quality, I guess, for all children in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next phase, what I think that is universal, is that all children on earth want to learn. 
learning is, if I understood it well, a kind of a desire, a kind of an immense desire to, to find yourself, to understand yourself, to step by step get hold of yourself, understand yourself. Learning is an enormous desire. And if you follow Antonovsky, we know today that um, learning, real learning over the years is also a health-giving quality. Yeah, it is amazing. Yeah, yeah. And so if you oversee this, then, then is that crowned by a last quality that is the quality that children, when they are so 12, 13, 14, probably it starts already when they are 11, but in education you can feel that, that they want to be taught in a way that they can love the world. That they learn to love the world. Now, if we round that up, and we look at these qualities, then you see, yeah, love, care, movement, play, imitation, imagination, the desire of learning, and then the desire to love the world and to come to forms of self-awareness. Yeah, I think... If, you, if we look at these qualities, then we can ask ourselves, yeah, what, what we need to meet these desires, this, this, yeah. And the first thing is, of course, that we should look for education that does not spoil these qualities. Uh, Laura, can you show us the second uh, piece? Here. This is a book that means the question book about education. I fear, and I'm sure it's not translated in English, and it is not translated in Dutch, uh, not in German, but it is a fantastic book. This book describes from where, it's really fascinating. This book describes from where the teaching forms we have in the first and second world, from where the teaching forms we have in the first and second world from where they are where where they have their origin and this book describes it's it's fabulous that nearly all the educational forms we use today classes tests school books inspectors that nearly all these forms have their origin in the industry. That basically how a school functions in the first world today is, a, is derived from the industry. It is not a form that was developed for education. So that is something where you feel indeed we can spoil what children really need already through our forms. Yeah, thank you, uh, Laura. <clears throat> and probably you can show the next uh, picture. Yeah, Laura, can you show the next one? Yeah, here. This is translated in English and in German. It's from a famous Belgian philosopher, David van Rijbroek. 
and he wrote a book. It's a small book about that we colonize our future. And he gives fantastic insights in this, in this question that the decolonization process has an impact on our future. That we, so he, he speaks it like this, that he said, we colonize our future through the decolonization process we are not opening a future that is open, but we give new uh, uh, impacts, we give new structures, we go give new beliefs, new understandings, how the future should be. And he calls that the colonization. And he said, if we decolonize, decolonize the past, we should make sure that we develop a open future and do not colonize it already so that in 200 years we have to decolonize it again. Uh, I tell you, this is very, it was for me a very impressive book because if you see in Holland, for example, but also in other countries, if you see how all this, uh, uh, how all this, uh, yeah, discussions are now going on, especially here in Holland, then, then uh, we fear that we uh, possess the future again. So that is uh, something I, that is for me, something that is within this idea that we can spoil the future that we can spoil that what the children need in their education. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, uh, that is uh, what I want uh, to tell you. Yeah, yeah, that is something. Yeah. If we look now uh, in our education and we look a little bit in the future, then uh, then we look the the impact that we need for the future, for understanding the world, for loving the world, has a highly, has a, a new impact today, has a new impact. An impact that should go in the direction that uh, we as teachers and the children start to understand that we and the world basically are one, that we and the world are, be are basically uh, one, that we have a responsibility for our earth and that we can live with, that we can learn to live with our world like a living being. That is something I, I would would like to uh, emphasize. All the geography, all the literature, all what we learn about the, the, the earth should have this aspect that the world is part of our own being. Yeah. I think that should uh, that, that should be something. If we go now to this uh, uh, human factor, then uh, I would like to enter that topic by looking at the memories of children. We just had uh, here in Holland, the 100 year anniversary of our Waldorf school, the, the Waldorf School of The Hague just celebrated his 100th birthday. And we had uh, 1,500 alumni around the school last Saturday. And it was a, a kind of festival of memories, a memory festival, you can imagine. And if you ask, little children before they go to the grade school when they are six or seven uh, what was most what was the most impressive time what was most impressive to them 
in the kindergarten time, in the time before, uh, and you ask them that when they are much older and they have a vivid memory, then you will hear very often that they say uh, the kindergarten time was just life. And we hope that they say it was a good life. So you see in the kindergarten time, the children have this all over experience and later memory that they lived their life there without any other uh, impact. It was just life. Yeah. When we look at a, in the in the in the grade school till class six, or probably five, five or six, and we ask alumni how that was for you. What do you what what is your memory about it? Then you often hear that the all over memory was was my teacher nice or not. Was she friendly? Was she lovely? He or her? Was there coherence? And that is that is so interesting. Eh? You do not often hear about what they have learned, but you hear very often. Was it nice? Was there a friendly atmosphere? Was it wonderful to be in class? And then you see often, you hear often that they are able to describe their, their, the, the classroom they, in which they were for years into the details that they describe what they could see when they looked out of the window. And then you, you see was then the feeling component, not the component of life, is so uh, is so dominant. Yeah. Was he nice? Was he friendly? Could you laugh with him or her? If you look in class six, seven, eight, and you look at the memories of the children, then there is an other quality in it. Then, it, then you meet the quality. Did he manage his class or she? Was he, was he, so to say, the captain on the ship? I just heard uh, uh, from, from this time, class seven and eight, that it was most impressive to the students that they said, yeah, there was a natural order in class, all was like it should be. And then comes and we learned a lot yeah yeah that's uh, that's amazing huh? and if you come then in the in the upper school in the high school then the memories go into the direction um, that is very interesting then the memories go into the direction of the authenticity yeah and uh, that is so striking if you ask alumni about our high school time then it is about, about the authenticity of their teachers. And the authenticity often shows itself in, in their more or less strange habits or something like that. That's very nice. Yeah, that is, uh, yeah, where they authentic. And if the students had the feeling that their teacher was authentic, that he was a teacher of his subject, that he or she and their subject could not be exchanged. He was the biology teacher. She was the English literature teacher. That there was no doubt she was the English literature person. Then if that if that if that aspect is there, then you see that uh, a, a teacher can make quite some mistakes. And they will all forgive it. If this, if this experience of the authenticity is there. Yeah. So over this path, 
we will now look into uh, this, what we call the human factor. The human factor. I will start that with the human factor with something very simple, but it, it is very funny. It is very funny. Once Steiner witnessed that uh, in in the interval, in in the in in the faculty meeting, uh, foreign language teachers stood together and were talking badly about the children, uh, how difficult they are, and that they are not obedient, and that uh, that it was terrible to teach them. And Steiner listened for a moment. And then he said to them, that is very funny. He said to them, change your temperance by inner decision. Become sanguine. This is something hmm? we always learn you have this temperament, you are this temperament, uh, you have to deal with it, then we say we have to develop it. Yeah, what is then development of a temperament? Uh, where you have to deal with it, you put, you try to get rid of the sharp edges from it and so on. But become sanguine by decision. That is something. Yeah. And there you see something shining of that human factor. Do we have in our education this, do we have this, um, this amazing, do we have, have we developed this flexibility? Have we developed this flexibility that we can change in a split second? There's an other quote by Steiner where he said, the moment you see a child from your class or from school, you know that child, from that, in that moment, you change yourself in the temperament of that child or student. And when you talk with him, you talk out of his temperament. That means the, 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 this side from the temperament, the teacher's side, has probably a much bigger impact because a, a lot of um, distress and difficulties in education come from inflexible, inflexible um, temperaments. And that is a big question, huh? how we work on ourselves, how we work in teacher training, that we learn to become temperament wise, that we have this inner flexibility. Yeah. That you can that you can change in the moment the style you talk, that you can change in the moment the way you are with certain children. So this quote um, becomes sanguine by decision. That is something very, yeah, yeah, that is something outstanding. There is another element, a second element that that touches that of the of the of the human factor in education. That is this. Um, shortly before the school in Stuttgart started. Steiner held a short uh, series of lectures in Dornach, strange enough, in Dornach. Six lectures under the title, The Educational Question as a Social Question. I still wonder why he did it in Dornach and not in Stuttgart, because it was when he finished that, he went to Stuttgart to start the school. And this, it, these are six very, very impressive lectures. And I tell you, in this lecture, he said, if children 
have the chance to imitate and to imitate the world around them in the kindergarten time and also in the first year of the grade school, if the imitation is uh, something we we foster, if the imitation is something we we develop, so to speak, give we po uh, if we give we possibilities that it is developed just with this orchestra from the from El Sistema. Then Steiner said, it gives a precondition for the longing for freedom when they are grown up. Now just think about it. Just think about it, what that means. Yeah, that the imitation as, uh, is, as it is explained on several places is, is a kind of a continuing of the activity in the pre-birth reality where you imitate the spiritual beings around you and that you continue that quality when you are on earth and that you that you imitate that what or what in the form of movements and actions is around you and believe me i found a, i found a quote by steiner where he said that the child at night decides which imitation should be hold should be held in his memory in his being that's a decision by the higher being at night isn't that amazing it's not so easy to understand that but just what an impact and then Steiner said something in that same lecture he said something that about coherence Steiner, Steiner you know did not use that word coherence he spoke about loving authority I guess we can say the same we can also say coherence yeah what is coherence coherence is that you are in tune in the class that you are in tune with your surrounding of your classmates and with your teachers that the teachers are uh, orientation point uh, a loving orientation point through which you can give your attention your orientation for the learning and sometimes i have i i ask myself is that question about uh, the the authority the the well understood authority is that still uh, is that still something that works in our in our society i give you a strange example i heard a couple of days ago a new class one somewhere started and the little boy is afraid to go into class and his mother said i i wait uh, in 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 the hall till he is in class and then the mother decided to wait the whole morning and she had instructed her son class one instructed her son that he can go to the toilet and then he sees his mother now that went for two weeks and then the mother was a little bit fed up with that and then she asked her mother the grandmother to take that over and now since weeks the grandmother sits in the hall waiting till the boy okay you can imagine the school asked uh, do you think is that the right way to help this boy to to accept school or to to find himself happy in school and the reaction of these parents were if you don't like that we do it like this we look for another school 
And then they said that they had an appointment with a psychologist to talk with the psychologist about the wishes of the son. So there you see that authority is not only a thing, uh, not only a quality in the in the in the human uh, factor in education, but it is a big big question in education at all. Also, home education, and it could it could happen that we need a a, a, a new effort, as it is done in Holland, where we have this. Schools for parents, where we help parents to do the right thing at to do the right things at home. Yeah, parent schools we call them. Yeah, yeah. Um, Laura, can you show us the next uh, plate? The next volume. I'm now talking a lot about that, but look here. Here's a book, Steiner, Wall of Pedagogy in Schools, a Critical Introduction by Martin Rawson. I tell you, I told him before that I will say that, that is an absolutely brilliant book. And all the topics we are discussing now, you find in this book very clearly mentioned. It's a joy reading. It is quite demanding, but he passes all these questions we are facing now. I, I give I give some examples. In the middle, in the middle uh, chapter is a big chapter. He gave uh, thirteen uh, yeah definitions about what wall of school or what what good education could be. Huh? The first is simple, wall of education takes the spiritual dimension seriously. Now, it is wonderful to describe it like this. Second, sense of coherence is the basics, basis for healthy learning and well-being. Then third, the quality of the teacher's preparation, of the teacher's preparation influences the quality of learning then children and young people need to be ready to learn and they need time to learn. And then learning is a rhythmical process. Now, how he builds that, he builds that, that he puts such a uh, such, um, uh, uh, sentence. I give you an example here. He puts such a sentence, um, for example, here. Activating the imagination through vivid pictorial descriptions and images is another powerful starting point for learning. Then he describes that, and then comes the interesting part. Then he said, the teacher can evoke vivid inner pictures of events, people and situations through narr narration, using verbal descriptions and images of phenomena, and be able to express complex ideas in pictures, analogies, and metaphors. Provide text or other materials from the other media that activate the pupil's imagination. That is then uh, the, 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 the teacher, what the teacher skills, uh, the human factor. And then comes the research question. What are the preconditions for activity? effective and vivid oral presentation. How can teachers best learn storytelling and presentational skills? You see, all what we discuss and all what we have discussed uh, last week is wonderfully written in this book. I can highly recommend it. And I hope that uh, that um, Laura will put that in the in the, the title and the, the book in, in the in the details. So you see that uh, that uh, Martin is very close there in this book. It is critical. It is an, a wonderful, very positive critical. It's a pleasure to read, but that he activates 
in all his descriptions, it is not so easy reading. You you need uh, you need uh, apart from the fact that it is wonderful reading, but it is uh, very concentrated and highly philosophical also, and that's wonderful. So if we look at the human factor, if you look at all these things, then we we have to ask ourselves, and you find answers in that book, we have to ask ourselves how we do it ourselves, that we find the right authority, that we find the right space for imitation, that third part, the, imitate, the, the authority gives them the feeling, the preconditioning, the precondition for the feeling of um, equality. That is so amazing. It gives the precondition that we can develop our feeling humans are equal through authority. Uh, in the year 2007, we did a, a big review in America, Germany, and Switzerland about uh, two cohorts of alumni. And we put also this question huh, to the alumni. What, what are your experiences with the human factor in the teachers? And then some uh, respondents said, the most painful situations in school were when they when they had to face the situation that some teachers loved some students more than others. Yeah. That they had their Lieblinge, as they say in German. And a special painful, they said then, was it if you were one of those who were, were especially, uh, so to say, uh, loved more than the others. Yeah. So there you see in this authority, in this feeling of coherence, there is something where uh, the class unites, don't misunderstand that word, unites around the guidance of a teacher in a way that the children forget themselves, that they are one between the others. And that's kind of a precondition for this quality. Yeah. And then Learning to love the world starts, of course, and you can find that in Martin's book, wonderfully described, of course, started with teachers who love their subject. That's a quote from me. <laughs> yeah. If the teacher loves his subject, then we build in our students a part of the love for the world. And that is something. Huh? Uh, so often we hear you have to be enthusiastic for what you do. Yes, of course. But do we really love all the subjects we teach? That is, that is something. And with that love is the same as, as with this temperament. Huh? become sanguine by decision. You can become uh, enthusiastic for a subject by decision. That's a form of self-education. That's a form of what you can say, uh, management, self-management of the soul become enthusiastic for every subject you have to teach. It sounds so simple, but here you see there, there is the, there, there the real things happen. Yeah. 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 So the imitation 
is a kind of precondition for the feeling of freedom, the coherence, the authority, a kind of precondition for equality, and loving the subject is a precondition for loving the world, and that is then a precondition for the feeling of brotherhood. You know that 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 nice quote by Steiner that he said, "Geography is the most Christian subject that exists because we share the world with all of us." Yeah, these are wonderful aspects. Um, I I want to share another element in this uh, human factor with you that is probably. Um, the most essential. Um, Laura, may I ask you for the next slide? Yeah, and now the next one. And now the next one. Yeah, thank you. Look here. That is out of an amazing book from the American uh, teacher and uh, physician, Adam Blanning. I, I show you that book later. And uh, there he, he shows this, that he said, that is a kind of psychological law that if you look at, at a, a teacher, that you look at the teacher, that, that you can see in the teacher that um, what the teacher realizes uh, in his physical being, that that works on the etheric constitution of the child. I call that always the genius of the kindergarten teacher. The task of the kindergarten teacher is what we said in the beginning, is life. The task of the kindergarten teacher is to provide life and healthy life through her physical presence. She represents health in its physical form. And that awakes, evokes the etheric learning qualities in the child. So I, I, I would love to say the kindergarten teacher is the genius of the physical being. If we look further, if we are in the grade school, then you see what we do, what we do, what, what uh, the, the physical works on the etheric. The etheric, the etheric forces, they uh, activate the etheric forces in me. They activate uh, um, the astral forces in the child. So the great school teacher is, so to speak, the genius of the astral body. He has to he has to uh, to develop his soul qualities in a way that the whole learning process in the etheric realm of the child starts to be. He's the genius of the uh, astral body. So the next higher uh, sheet works on the next lower in the child. It's a kind of, of a psychological, spiritual psychological law. Yeah. And if you see, then, then, uh, then, um, so the the great school teacher is, so to speak, the genius of the soul. 
and awakes the learning capacities of the child. If we are in the high school, then the eye of the teacher works on the astral body of the student, as we described that when that when we spoke of authenticity. So the, the 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 individual, the authenticity, the individual forces, the, the individuality of the high school teacher carves and develops the astral body of the student. These are incredible, important rules. They are, for example, the same in a family, by the way. But uh, if you see that, then, then we have to ask ourselves, yeah, when we work with kindergarten children, then we have to, to, to have this, this, this health in us. Our striving is our physical health. When we are in the grade school, our striving is, so to say, that our soul is clean so that children can learn through the etheric that's then awakened. And in the high school, through our authenticity, through our individuality, we form, we, we design parts of the astral body in the students. Yeah. And if we would continue, then you can see the spirit selves has an, an effect on the eye of the students. But that is outside the range of, uh, of education. That is something that could uh, work in, in teacher training, for example. But what I want to say is that you see here that um, we have uh, 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 we have certain tasks. We have the task to work on our physical health. We have the task to work on our etheric purity. And we have the task to work on our on our soul. We have the task to to identify ourselves with ourselves. You see, this human factor that is very close, that is very direct, that is very nearby, and that gives us uh, an, an enormous impact. Uh, I spoke about that book from uh, Martin. Uh, the last of the 13, 13 uh, frames, so to speak, is that he speaks about the senses. Yeah, indeed. Through all these years, we have to be aware how, as a human factor, the use of our senses is. The, our senses are the portals to the soul. Our senses are the portals to learning at all. Our senses are the portal to our understanding of the world and our love of the world. That is quite essential. So if we ask ourselves now uh, how, we, how we can do that, yeah, then I would like to come back, Laura, on this uh, novalis sentences. Uh, yeah, completely being oneself is a art. Yeah, it is not a something you achieve. An artist is always underway. It is an art. That means it goes so, it goes so, it can go in all directions. Completely being yourself is a art. Uh, art is never is never complete. It's always we are always on the way. You can and you are what you are able to be. Man kann und ist was man will. Yeah. D do we, as teachers or trainers or students who want to become teacher? Are we in the full possession of our will? That means is our self, our I, so tuned that we can do what should be done. That we can walk our talk. 
Yeah. I'm not so sure if, if it is absolutely clear what I mean, but you can and you are what you're able to be. Man kann und ist, was man will. We are more or less an I as we want to be it. Yeah, so in in these sentences you you see that um that um being a teacher is an ongoing learning process or let's say an ongoing process of uh, of uh, um development i guess the human factor in this is on the one hand you are developing you 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 question everything but also you try to be master of your your will forces yeah. now this was just a, a rough sketch uh, how i think about this important issue about the human factor because we all know that the success or not in world of ed education depends on very much on this human factor we have not spoken about the human factor in the in the social fabric of a school that would be another topic to work on I want to say to thank Laura Ruggen for uh, making these slides happen. And I give back to Martin. Thank you very much, Christoph. Yeah, that was um, a small work of art uh, in thoughts and presence. It's astonishing how much presence comes over in this zoom medium yeah. um, if you're taking us with you in those thoughts which i think many of us perhaps all of us could experience yeah well the f the floor we don't really have one but the virtual floor is open for questions or responses reactions um use the little hand to signal if you want to say something, and I guess we'll pick it up. Yes, Will. Hello. I wonder if um, we could just explore this idea about um, working on your own astral body in order to help the child's etheric body to grow. Because for me, those words are really hard to understand. And I'd like I'd like it in a bit more of a concrete descriptive way um, that I could yeah perhaps help me understand it a bit better. Uh, that's very easy. Uh, forget astral body and say soul. And you understand, if your soul has the beauty and the richness that it can meet the children, then the children wants to learn and develop. So if you are enthusiastic for something you bring, uh, uh, spelling, grammar, mm -hmm. math, calculations. If you do that with a, a, a inner joy that you can bring that to them, that is soul. And that works on the children. Then they want to learn that. If you see that as an obligation and uh, it's not your business to, to, to handle math and at least not grammar, then you feel the children will not open up. So it's not so difficult to understand. Forget that word astral body. 
take for it soul, that's the same. And the soul should radiate to the children in joy for that what has to be learned. Does that make sense for you, Will? Yeah, it does. I'm still a bit puzzled on how this works on the child's etheric, because that word's still kind of throwing me. Um, what does what can you kind of translate that bit? Hey, that's also not so difficult. Uh, I found a quote by Steiner where where he said the etheric forces are the learning forces. So if a child wants to learn. If a child learns, it develops his etheric qualities. And the etheric qualities are the health-giving qualities and the intellectual-giving qualities. They have their origin in, in, the, in, in the lower parts of the being and are set free to use when, they, when, when we have school readiness. So you you experience that when you work with children. You know, when you enjoy math, when you enjoy calculation, when you enjoy grammar in class three, the children enjoy it. And then through the enjoy, through their joy, they develop their skills. And developing skills is a form of learning that, re, that reinforces the etheric quality. And from that we depend. Thank you. Yeah. There, there's a question in the chat. Maybe we could, um, maybe Laura could show us the book cover of the Adam Blenning book. I think that was yeah. one of the things that was asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have that also in the slides. Yeah, okay, great. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, there it is. Yeah, that is so interesting. If you see the book from Martin and you see this book, they are completely different. This is mostly written from the point of view of a, of a medical professional, but they, 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 uh, yeah. But this against Martin. Um, it supports it. It supplements. They, they it. support. They support each other. Wonderful. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Perhaps we can come back to the overall. Any more questions? I see Lord has a hand up, a real hand, not a yellow one. Thank you. Hey. Thank you for mentioning so much the little child. I have a question. If uh, Steiner said that the child holds out of imitation what he will need in in the future, uh, why do we carry so much about imitation? Why do we worry so much about imitation? Is, is, if he is choosing in what he imitates, what he will need, uh, why do we care so much about what he imitates or not? Because he will choose. You understand my question? I understand the question, but uh, the, the accent is a bit different. So in that quote, I, I, I look today at it, that quote Steiner says, the child, the higher being of the child at night will decide which form of imitation he cannot use and okay. that he will throw out. Okay. Yeah. That makes more sense. Yeah. yeah. So... We are, and, and then Steiner said for the, in, in that other quote, Steiner said for the future, we need much, much more possibilities for children to imitate. Not less, but more. Yeah. Because of freedom. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think another word for, for imitation in this sense is, is participation, to, to join in um to partake uh engage in activities that 
um, people are meaningful activities that people are doing. I think sometimes we think of imitation much more in a kind of uh, mirroring way. You know, mm -hmm. child stands in front of adult and reproduces. But um, I think in it's a much more holistic process of the, the, somehow the word imitation sometimes gives the impression that you're standing and observing, which they're not doing in that sense. They're joining in and and recreating the activities yep. that surround them. And it's this because it's a recreating, it also is strengthening their own um, life forces as well. Yeah. 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 And if the activities that they're doing obviously are meaningful, that means they are connected to things that are transparent, that are manifest, that we can see what's going on. Yeah. And it strengthens that. Yeah. But I thought that I think Will's question is it is a it is. I think one can understand that there is this correspondence. Um, I think the 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 second part of the question: Why is it is is this sort of um, why isn't it like for like? You could imagine if I live a, an ordered, structured, rhythmical life. In other words, you know, I emphasize my own life processes and etheric. You would think that strengthens the chart but it's not it's well also it is but it's also this next step ahead it's like the adult is preparing the next step of development there's this this higher is not just higher uh, vertically it's also it's more horizontally expanded uh, it's offering more opportunities, but the child cannot do them autonomously yet, cannot do them on her own. Right. Yeah. She has to, it, it requires a structure, it requires a scaffolding, it requires a support, which pulls the child into uh, the next level of development so that they, they, they then become independent. Anyway, I sometimes think that that metaphor um, of the next step of development or learning is, is quite helpful in that respect. But are there other questions or comments or observations? I mean, there's a question in the chat that perhaps Christoph could share a few thoughts about the human factor in social processes, although, it, as he said, it could be a whole lecture in itself. But do we have any other questions from what we've heard? Okay. There's a question about the GA number of the, I think you're talking about the um, the social lectures. Yeah. 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 Uh, you want the GA number of that? I think somebody would like to have the GA that number is in German. GA 296. 296. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in English it's called the social aspect social aspect of the educational question yeah. yeah maybe christoph you could say a few words about the human factor in the social life of school um yeah or maybe just maybe just point us in in a, in, in a direction because we don't have so much time left yeah 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 um, now, we see, generally spoken, generally spoken, we see that Waldorf schools, in general, are um, sensitive, very sensitive, for social disruptions. And that is, for me, a beginning question. Why is that? Why is that? Um, much more than uh, than than state schools, we all know that. Huh? And uh, a beginning for an uh, answer for me is that uh, probably um, we have to rethink the idea of the school. One of the big problems 
in education today is the 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 overkill on individualism in children. Probably we have that also in our in our uh, faculties. Uh, overkill on individualism and probably not enough that quality of the togetherness that we together make something uh yeah that these are all questions to me huh? um if you look there are schools who manage it and they manage it because they have an absolutely strict uh, structure. You have to obedient to that structure. And you have to be part of the faculty meetings. But we see also schools where uh, that does not work anymore where you see that the, 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 the organism of the school is split up in, is split in, in little uh, groups with their own responsibility and the all over, uh, the all over idea of the community is not well developed. And then you see, and then you see that the individual principle, yeah, runs out of its rails. I guess that's a big question today. Uh, we, uh, in, in Germany, you could see in, in the Corona time that uh, that had nearly exploded. Huh? So uh, the, 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 the obedience, the community obedience to the idea and in its practicality uh, that we are obedient to the forms and structures we have given to school, that is, I guess, there we, the, there we face something difficult today. And in that line, we see, I think also, we should find new ways in, in working with the parents. Not in the way that we uh, convince them that we do always the things right, but that, that we develop ways, um, uh, that we develop ways that we say, uh, teachers and parents, are both those who, uh, yeah, who work on 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 the well-being of the children? Can we share with each other how we do that? Uh, you see, it's not very clear what I say, but uh, I guess we should develop an educational partnership. That is something what what we 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 should have, and we have in in Holland three uh, schools, parent schools and grandparent schools, by the way, also, because more and more grandparents play a, a role in education. Uh, that is a form that works well, and is also popular. What you uh, uh, the the example I gave about that boy in class one, uh, you see a, 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 a mental a mental structure going completely out of order. If the parents would have a little bit of idea how you to how to handle a little boy, then you could avoid all these troubles. And there are lots of these troubles. The kindergarten teachers can talk about it. Now something like that. It's a big chapter. Educational partnership between parents and teachers. I guess we have to develop forms for that. Yes, it, thank you. It is Any, very quiet on the other side. It is. They're very quiet today. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can, can you say something? Is it very terrible for you to hear that all, or are you already on, on other planets? I don't have no. No, I got. Oh, I see a hand, uh, Daniel. Yeah, I have done something. Hi. Yeah, Daniel Hi. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a class teacher with class seven at the moment in Elmfield in England. And the question that you're talking about there is very close to my heart in the sense that I, I think that social cohesion and, and just learning to coexist with each other, mm -hmm. learning to be with a group of human beings and find common purpose and find common understanding. Is, is so important and, and I really think that actually in terms of the future so much that's raining into us now is, is almost pushing us to a more one-sidedness in our own individuality but of course it's a paradox and, and what really I find very inspiring is to, is to think about what do we develop in the personality when it has to there's almost a higher part of our personality when we're amongst the children and when they're amongst themselves, they have to overcome themselves when they're annoyed or when someone is getting on each other's nerves. And how, how do we genuinely come to a common understanding together? And, and I really believe that the strengthening of, of that social fabric is, is going to be what allows us to stand as human beings in a world where it's more and more difficult to do so and I think that question becomes so essential mm. um, and I think that you know this idea of different bodies supporting different bodies but even the idea that those of us as adults that have learned how to stand in the world and to share that experience with other human beings that's already very meaningful for children uh, especially budding adolescents, because they they see a world that's full of chaos right now, full of mm -hmm. there isn't a brotherhood impulse in humanity. No, there's more of a separation. There's yeah. much more animosity. There's much more differing of opinions and clashing of opinions and viewpoints. But I think if you can achieve that coming together in a meaningful way, that that, that gives you something in lifelong learning. And I think this is really a key, is, is not just making them happy next week, but yeah, yeah. equipping to be happy later in life. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I understand well what you mean, yeah. Yeah. I think as a, we have a particular challenge to overcome anxiety and fear, yeah. I mean, I was thinking more in terms of the parents, but of course, with the children as well. But um, people are um, almost existentially insecure. And obviously, that makes the education process so much more essential. It can't fail. It must succeed. Mm -hmm. And everybody feels that pressure from day one. Teachers, children, parents. And perhaps that's where grandparents can take a little bit more of a relaxed yeah. perspective on it. But I think the new forms that we need have to clearly not be um, top down and not kind of vertical. We know we're expert yeah. because yeah. you're bound to fail if you do that. It has to be much more um, at eye level. We have to be tolerant of mistakes and um, and also tolerant of confusion. Um, I think that's something that we probably need new forms in our school communities yeah, yeah. to be able to deal with that. Yeah. That's what also, I meant with the educational yeah. partnership. Huh? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could I add something, Martin? Uh, yes, I can't, it sounds like Alan. Yeah, it is, it is Alan. It is, yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, it's to the theme of anxiety, but also Christoph linking to the the class one child who won't go into the, the classroom and is supported by the parents and then the grandparents. In the UK now, there's almost a whole industry 
a whole industry around trying to get children into school. I know because two of my children work in that industry and the pressure on the schools to make sure that children attend, uh, that the schools tick certain boxes in terms of, of statistics and attendance, means that charities and educational health organisations offer services to help parents to get children into school. And if you've got the child in the corridor, you've done very well because there'll be some in the car park and there'll be some who haven't even left home. And the parents, from their anxiety, my experience of them is that they have had little or no experience or little or no positive experience of authority. Mm. And the word authority, we have to avoid and shy away from. We have to find alternatives. So that I think the coherence is an excellent addition to the vocabulary. And the moment we ask certain parents of a certain generation to bring authority into their parenting, they indeed run a mile and choose another school. It's not a question, it's just a contribution. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much, Alan, yeah. Yeah, I, I see that, yeah. Yeah, in our country, it's not so wild till now, but uh, certainly it will come also, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, well, I think our time is nearly uh, rounded up, unless somebody would like to have one last final comment or say. Otherwise, I would just like to thank Christoph um, for being Christoph <laughs> and sharing his considerations with us uh, so generously uh, this evening. Yeah. So, okay. Laura, we who is on next week? <laughs> Next week, it is Rim Morwat on educational leadership in times of crisis. Yeah, Rim from, from the Lebanon. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very good. All right. Yeah. Thanks also to you, Martin, for taking over this moderation. It was really great. Thanks. Right. Okay. okay. So, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is. <laughs> Make sure it's good. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.